Today we will continue from where we left off last week. Uh, we will continue in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 5. Uh, just a five minute recap. Let's see what time is it? We are good. Uh, five minute recap. Like, we just finished the letters for the churches. That unified letter that basically lays the foundation of the whole book of Revelation. And uh, we, as God uh, is last reported knocking the door of our hearts in Revelation 3, uh, John sees a door open and he enters on that door through the throne room of God, like the place where his throne is. And when he arrives there, he sees uh, a scene that's like a description of the inner sanctum of uh, God's operation. And um, he has like a majestic scene, sighting, like the ones that Ezekiel or Isaiah had before him. And uh, on chapter 4, we see that how the surround is described. We see the throne, he describing the throne, how the angels, how the living beings that are there praising God. And, uh, but the, the throne is empty. We, we see that there's a vacant spot there. And that's where we start now in Revelation 5. So let's read uh, Revelation 5, verse 1, to see after, G after he has like this panoramic view. I don't know if you guys ever went, enter in like one of those big cathedrals, like Notre Dame, or that's near here, not the, the one in France, the one the one in uh, South Bend, or let's say another big, another big cathedral here in the U.S. I don't know any, but not with them. So yeah. there, there, there's an evangelical temple that they call like the, uh, I think it's the, the Glass Cathedral or something like that. Crystal, Crystal Cathedral, yes. Uh -huh. That's like a, when you enter in such places, first thing you do, like uh, your jaw drops and then you look, how around it. And then after you've recomposed yourself, then you start to pay attention to whoever is preaching or whatever. And that's what happened with John. Chapter 4, his jaw dropped and he looked to everything. But now he looks to the center of the room and what he sees. Let's go. 5, and, verse 1. And I saw on the right, and I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Mm -hmm. So he sees a book. Later, uh, we're going to know in more detail what this book is. Uh, but this book is the book of the covenant. And this book was sealed with uh, seven seals. And uh, uh, what else he sees uh, about this book. Let's see, let's read verse 2 and 3. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So, he saw that book, sound mysterious, sealed, nobody could open, nobody could look at it. To it, so he probably was in shock, like because nobody could not even contemplate it or look inside or understand what was inside. But then something strange happens. Let's read verse four. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. So he wept. And uh, he wept a lot, like, but why? Why do you think Jonah wept? 
What was so important with this book that he, by the mere mention that nobody could open, nobody could look inside, he wept. Hmm? What did you say? Ah, it broke his heart, but why? There are several reasons. We don't have that background because we didn't live in John's days. But uh, in his time, on the coronation of the king, few special things happened. Remember I mentioned last week that uh, each uh, section of the book has a, a, a one of the festivals, annual festivals, as a backdrop. The backdrop of the churches is Passover that has to do with salvation. The backdrop of uh, that section that starts here and goes to the end of the seven seals is um, Pentecost. That has to do, as we saw, with the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a result of Jesus being enthroned on, uh, on heaven as the rightful uh, king of earth after he uh, recovered it from the hands of Satan by being our second Adam, by, tri by being triumphant where Adam fell. So, uh, in the times of the kings of Judah, when the king was coronated, he would uh, receive uh, a book that he would read, and that Moses actually mandated them to read every, at least uh, once a year. That was the book of the covenant, the book that uh, uh, narrated the story of uh, God's love and how he took care of the people. In the king's times was probably the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. But as the time passes, that book grew and became our Bible. And uh, why he wept at surface is because if nobody could open it, nobody could read it, nobody could be king. But there is more to it. There is something uh, that we have to go to, uh, to the Old Testament to take a look in Leviticus uh, 25, verses 23 to 28. When you get, guys get there, say amen. Amen. 25, verses 23 to 28. 25. Verses 23 to 28. So, yeah. Uh, 25, what now? 25, 23 to 28. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. It will, be, it will, in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if, he, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what, is his, what his brother sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since it was, since its sale and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possessions. But if he is not able to have it restored to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the, and in the Jubilee it shall be released and he shall return to his possession. So this whole section of the book of Leviticus is talking about a, a figure that in Hebrew is called the Goel, and a rough translation is the Redeemer. 
That's why we call Jesus uh, our Redeemer. Because there are several types of Goel, uh, of Redeemer, on this chapter. There is those like that, like uh, if you are a child or incapable to defend yourself, your next of kin or your Goel would come and defend you. Jesus is our, our older brother. And uh, if you got destituted, you lost your land, as in this case here. The Goel, on the right time, would come and rescue you. And Jesus is our rescuer. And uh, that's the context of uh, uh, one of the contexts of how he's our Goel. Earth was ours. We lost because of sin. But because of uh, the cross, he now paid the price. And he is taking over, taking back what was ours to give back to us. That's why the book of Revelation ends with us inheriting the earth and living in, and, uh, with him forever. But there is a situation, a special application of that law that we, sh we only see once on the Bible like that example. And so we have to move to Jeremiah 32, 6 to 15. Amen. Jeremiah 32, 6 to 15. So let's read. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamal, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field, which is in Anathroth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Then Hanamal, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anathroth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption yours, buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field from Hanimal, Hanimal and the son of my uncle who was in Anathroth, and weighed out for him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses, and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the purchase deed to Barak, the son of Merah, son of Maheshia, and the son of Merah, the son of, I did that read twice, huh? the presence of Hanimal and my uncle's son in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who were set in the court of the prison. Then I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this deed which is open, and put them in the earthen vessel, that they may, it last, that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Picture the scene. Like uh, Jerusalem is about to fall. And uh, God is saying, surrender. Let it go. But one day you guys are going to come back. Nobody was believing it. And uh, what uh, God says, like, go. And, s and sell that land to your cousin as, as that customer we just read in Leviticus. Because he's going he's gonna, to uh, be your goel. He's going to rescue it to you. So uh, he paid. They signed the book. The book was sealed. And uh, so nobody could open. And uh, they part the way, he didn't take possession. Why? Because... He only will take possession after captivity. Once they come back, then he could open the deed and uh, recoup the, the land that was his. 
And uh, that's precisely where we stand. Jesus is the one that paid the price. The book is already signed. Everything is signed, sealed, and paid on the cross. We are just waiting the end of our captivity so we can go back to the land. And uh, that's why uh, when people t- uh, that John uh, cried, because he understood that like uh, if Jesus was not able to open that book, our salvation was not guaranteed. Something was still to be done. But because if nobody could open, that means we were doomed. And uh, that book is the book that has my story and your story. It's our book. It's our deed. It's the record of our salvation, what Jesus did for us. And uh, that's why Jesus, I mean, John wept. Because we realize if that's true, if nobody can open, then my salvation is in vain. My, my hopes of salvation are vain. So what happens next? Let's read verse 5 of Revelation 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So he hears one of the elders saying, Don't worry. The lamb of the uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is worthy to open it. And we know who the lamb the lion is, right? That's a clear symbol of Jesus. But what happens next? Uh, verse uh, 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Here we see again the same one of the features of the book of Revelation that we saw already in chapter 1, where John sees something, and then he looks, and he see, I mean, he hears something, and then he looks and sees something else. That's not the opposite, but it's a complementary thing. He heard the lion of the tribe of Judah could open the seals. Now he looks to the throne to see the lion with the, the book on his hands. And what he sees? He sees the lamb that was slain and was resurrected. He sees the resurrected Jesus. That's one and the same. So it's just a different picture that helps to bring uh, everything to, uh, to the fullness. And he sees that he has seven horns. Horns in the Bible is the symbol of power, authority. So he has plentiful at the perfect authority and the seven spirits of, of uh, God, the fullness of uh, God's spirit on him. And uh, once he opens the seals, what happens? Let's read verse 7. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He took from God the, seal, the, the scroll and what he did next. Let's read verses 8 to 14. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests in our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying. 
Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said amen, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. You see the scene. Once the books start to be opened, how heaven bursts in joy. Because now Jesus was enthroned. After he died on the cross, after he saved us, that was the public demonstration that now Satan was no more and that he, his days were counted. He, he paid the price for you and me. And now we are just waiting the days of our captivity to be done in order to live with him forever and ever. Hallelujah. And John concludes the book, uh, I mean the chapter, with the vision of the book being opened. And, uh, and on chapter 6, we see that book being opened slowly over the centuries. And that's what we're going to unfold next week. And uh, here, we see that uh, in a very graphical way, that Jesus now is sitting on the right hand of the, fa of the Father. He bought us back. And he's waiting just at the time of his providence to come and bring us home. He has total dominion of earth and, earth and the whole universe. And nothing can take away what this is. Nothing can take you away, can snatch you away from his hands. And uh, because he paid the price, because now he sits, we can rest assured that his return is certain. His promise is faithful. And... Uh, his victory is already guaranteed. His departure has already begun. We just read it about it. And uh, each one of us is the supreme object of his love and the supreme object of his interest. And if we listen to his voice, if we follow his advice, if we follow his command, we also will sit on the throne with him forever. Hallelujah. So with that, I want to leave you guys uh, hoping for two things. To meet with Jesus and to see the end of that party once he returns. And uh, once we will have our eternity with him. But also, I want to leave you excited to be here next week to see how that book reads. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven. Thank you so much for such display of uh, splendor, power, and authority that we just read. You defeated Satan. As, a, as the second Adam, you triumphed where Adam felt. And because you won, we can also rest assured that our salvation is granted. Because by your sacrifice, you bought us back from slavery, and now we are in our way to the Holy Land. We cannot wait for the day where we're going to see you face to face. Help us to remain in your hands. Help us to surrender to your love and live by your grace every day. Help us to hear your voice as you knock the door of our hearts and let us open so you can enter and can sit not only on the throne of the universe, but also in the throne of our hearts and lead our lives and uh, guide us safely until we meet face to face. Bless us, keep us, bless all of those here, each family he represented, also those that are watching through the internet, give us Peace in your spirit. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.